Hello, welcome. It's great to be here. My name is Greg Kennedy, and I spend a lot of time thinking about juggling. I first learned to juggle when I was a kid. I started with traditional objects, clubs, balls, rings. So I'd like to start off by showing you a little bit about this, and we'll figure out together why jugglers have been using these props for so long with an engineering perspective. Now, a ball is the exact same height, width, and depth. This means however I, however I throw it in the air, however it spins or rotates, when I throw and catch it again, I end up throwing the exact same object. And that's why balls are the easiest object to juggle. <laughs> now rings are a little different. Rings are much taller and wider than they are deep. So if I throw it in this orientation with a little bit of spin, it's very stable. But if I try to throw it this way, it's not very stable, it just flops in the air. And you can probably figure out what's the easiest way to juggle rings. Now a ring is also much bigger than a ball, it's much more visible, you can see it from far away. But to the juggler, if you look at it from their perspective, it's still very, very narrow. This means I can throw it between the other objects in the air very easily. A club is much longer than it is tall and wide. This means if I try to throw it, it kind of is fairly unstable, unless I flip it in the air. And this is how most jugglers juggle clubs. While it is a little bit more difficult than rings and balls, it does have its advantages. If you look at the centroid or the balance point of the club, it's way over here, very far away from where my hand holds the club. This means if I want to do a body throw around a part of my body, such as under the leg, behind the back, or through the legs, the club is actually much easier than the ball or the ring. Now, jugglers have explored these objects for many, many years. Some for decades, some for hundreds, and some for even thousands of years. But juggling has changed a lot in the last few years, and I feel privileged to be part, part of what the community calls the modern juggling movement. A small group of artists around the world who are trying to invent new forms of juggling and push the boundary of the art form. But when I was a kid, I was into tradi traditional props. I would practice these for a long time. I would try to do six clubs at one time, seven rings, and up to nine balls. But after a little while, I thought about it and I figured out, no matter how many objects I had going in the air, there was always going to be one more object to add. So at that point, I decided to juggle a little less with my body and spend a little bit more time juggling with my mind. And that's what this lecture is really about. I'd like to start off with a piece that I wrote over 20 years ago. When I was still working in engineering, I found this bowl. And I figured out that if I dropped a ball in it, it would roll in a straight line. If I threw it rapidly to the side, it would go in almost a perfect circle. Somewhere in between, a spiraling ellipse coming up to the other hand. Like I juggled in the air. I figured out I could juggle on the inside surface of this bowl.
Now, over the years, I spent countless hours throwing, bouncing, and rolling balls on different sculpture I create, and I've learned a lot along the way. If you take a ball and you roll it on a flat surface, it'll go in a straight line. If you want to change the path of that ball, you can change the surface that you're rolling on. Or, alternately, you can change the shape of the object you're rolling. to label people. You're either a creative person or you're a logical person. And I personally believe we're all both. I challenge everyone here to think about thinking with both your left and right brain at the same time because our lives are going to be a lot richer the closer all of us are to the universal man. Give you a second.
next piece I want to do with you uh, is a piece I wrote while I was playing with my son Sebastian when he was just two years old. We were playing with boxes. And the game quickly became I, as the father, would build a tower. And Sebastian, as my son, would knock it down. <laughs> so I'd build another tower and he would knock it down. I'd build another tower and he would knock it down. And while Sebastian thought this was the most fantastic game ever, I need a little more intellectual stimulation. <laughs> So I started building different towers, putting the small box on the bottom, turning them 45 degrees. And soon enough, I came across this beautiful little stack that I knew I had to share with people. In just a moment, I'm going to share it with you. And afterward, you're going to come up to me and you're going to go, oh, that's so clever. How did you come up with it? I'm going to explain to you that I don't feel I did. My son Sebastian did. Because when it comes to exploring the world around you, who's the expert? Me? You? Or a two-year-old child? <laughs> One more thing. I spent $100,000 on engineering school. <laughs> 20 years ago, I wrote my first original juggling piece, rolling balls in that clear plastic bowl. I won a gold medal. I made a name for myself in the juggling community. At the time, it was so important to me, I didn't want to share it with anyone. Fast forward many, many years, I created Conic. This time, I was even more successful. I got two million views on YouTube. I was featured on the Discovery Channel. I toured the world with Cirque du Soleil for five years. But at this point in my life, I was in a different place. I had a little more perspective. I was looking to share my art, to teach. I want people to look at what I do, learn from it, build upon it, and eventually create their own work. This is true in art, science, life, and even juggling. <laughs>